Good morning and welcome to our STS-56 post-landing news conference. Our players this morning from your left are Brewster Shaw, Deputy Manager at Space Shuttle Program, and Bob Seek, KSC Launch Director. We'll start off with Brewster. <clears throat> well, if I'd known that these post-landing press conferences were such a piece of cake, I'd have started coming a long time ago. Uh, if you recall, nine days ago, uh, on our second try, we uh, launched this flight uh, on time after a uh, really quiet countdown. And uh, that was uh, a precursor to a really quiet mission. The vehicle performed extremely well. We had very few in-flight anomalies. Uh, we discussed those, uh, as a matter of fact, day before yesterday in preparation for getting ourselves ready for uh, uh, a launch a week from today. Uh, very few in-flight anomalies. The hardware performed very well. The crew performed very well. And although it'll take the science community uh, some time to, to get through all of their data, uh, we think that uh, we achieved the mission of this uh, uh, flight and, and collected the, the data that the uh, science community was looking for, at least uh, to the best of our ability to understand what, the, what their data is now. We think that that was accomplished. But as I said, uh, it generally takes them a while to, to get through all that. Uh, the weather yesterday, of course, precluded us from uh, landing here in Florida on uh, the end of mission day. So uh, we waved off knowing that today's weather was forecast to be very good, not only here, but also in California if, if we needed to use that site. And uh, consequently, uh, the uh, forecasters had been telling us all week that Saturday morning was going to be beautiful in Florida, and indeed it was, and uh, the hardware is being towed back to the uh, OPF right now. So uh, all in all, uh, from our standpoint, it was a very successful mission. Uh, we couldn't have asked for things to go better. We, of course, did have, and you've heard about it during the mission, a problem with a high data rate uh, system, which is still being trouble. Uh, we're still troubleshooting that. We spent some time working on that yesterday on uh, the extra day we had. And we found that we have an intermittent problem. And as you all know, intermittent problems are, are hard, to, hard to find. So we've laid out a plan uh, to work on that as soon as we get the vehicle back in the OPF and have access to the systems. Uh, we're going to spend uh, about 72 hours of concentrated troubleshooting uh, trying to figure out which side of the interface our problem is. Uh, and isolate it to, to the best of our abilities so we can fix it. Uh, we don't see that as any threat to uh, the next flight, uh, uh, 55, uh, Space Lab D2. We can utilize the low data rate systems that, w that we have to get all the data down for D2, so we don't, uh, we're not worried about that at this time. Uh, so it was a, a fine flight. Crew performed uh, very well, and everybody, by the way, is in great shape uh, back on the ground now. And uh, we're looking forward to flying again next Saturday. Bob? Well, the, uh, the quick look from the uh, landing performance was that all the systems worked as advertised. The, the tires look, look a little better than average. The tile assessment looks to be about average. So uh, we won't have too much work for the, the tile crews in the OPF. And, and from the mission performance standpoint, there's, there's nothing that's going to be a a real driver in the in the turnaround for for this vehicle's next flight in uh, in July. The uh, so it's good news for the OPF crews. They've got a vehicle to go work on again, uh, and it, and it really looks in good shape. It the crew commented that it it served them well, and and from physical appearances, they obviously took good care of it. Also, the uh, so this this is the kind of thing that that perks the team up. We always like landings at KSC, but uh, this one is uh, e even more special because we haven't had an orbiter horizontal in, in the processing facility for, for many weeks now. And as you know, our next uh, mission is, is doing well out at the, at the pad, and a week from now we should be T minus one hour and something and, and counting, and we're looking forward to that too. Let's proceed to questions. Jim? Jim Banky, Florida today. Um, question for Brewster as pilot. Could you uh, maybe review a little bit about what the concerns were that Hoot was addressing and coming around the hack and the winds and the energy sure. and Q bar and all that? And then I have a question for Bob after that. Okay, well, the, uh, <clears throat> the thing we looked at this morning with respect to the weather uh, was 
was the winds, upper altitude winds. We had uh, uh, a report of uh, 140 knot jet stream over the, over the field at uh, somewhere between 35 and 40,000 feet. And what that means is as you approach the heading alignment cone uh, and start to turn the vehicle around to line it up with the runway, you have a strong tailwind. And uh, a strong tailwind will tend to blow the vehicle uh, off the hack if you don't uh, get, uh, if you're not very aggressive in anticipating the guidance commands. And so what Hoot was looking at was, do we, did we need to do any special procedures or, uh, or um, ask uh, Ken Cameron to do anything different than his normal training in order to fly under those conditions of a high, uh, a high tailwind approaching the hack? And um, so the words that uh, were generated were passed up to Ken, and he was well prepared. They anticipated that very well. And all the calls I heard uh, coming around the hack were on energy at, at uh, 180, 90, and rolling out on final. So he did an excellent job of anticipating guidance and staying ahead of the game. Question for Bob on, on the hardware. Uh, how soon before the orbiter gets back in the OPF and the scientists get their hands on the various tape recorders uh, for Atmos and Spartan and whatnot? Well, that, the activity is going to start really this this week. The doors uh, the doors should be open sometime uh, early in the week. We uh, were then then the, of course the experimenters get to go to work, and we're also going to do the troubleshooting on this this interface between the, the experiments and the KU band, and that'll probably take us uh, to the end of the week. But there should be hands on that hardware by midweek. Shreesh Dati with the Orlando Sentinel for uh, first for Brewster. Uh, could, if you could expand on what Ken Cameron had to do differently, uh, was it a more angled bank as he went from the 180 to the 90, or was it less steep? Uh, did he have to change the settings at all? Uh, what what was different about this than than normal? Well, the th the way. Uh, the way the guidance reacts to a strong tailwind approaching the hack is it requires a steeper bank angle as you roll onto the hack in order to, to get the vehicle turning. Otherwise, the strong wind tends to blow you outside of the hack. And, uh, and so what Hoot had seen in the STA, shuttle training airplane, was a requirement for up to about 60 degrees of bank angle where normally 45 or so is enough. And so those words were passed up to uh, to Ken and, uh, and by anticipating the guidance command, and that's thinking ahead of what you're going to have to do, uh, he stayed right on top of it. And uh, let's see, we asked him, we asked who, what the G level was that uh, he saw in the STA, and it was, he said, less than 1.7. So it didn't require a lot of G, but it did require a, a pretty good bank angle. Okay, and uh, did, uh, did Cameron take over control <coughs> earlier than normal? Uh, if not, where? What altitude was he at uh, when he took manual control? Uh, typically, uh, the commander gets in the loop uh, just under Mach 1, and that's uh, between 40 and 50,000 feet. And for, uh, for Bob C., do you have any sort of estimates on touchdown and rollout? No, but we'll have that later in the, in the morning. Go to J1. So, um, Chen, both of you touched on this, so that we're now one week and about an hour and a half or so away from the, the next launch. What concerns do you have about putting the, the landing and launch so tight to, to each other since this will set a new record? From a programmatic standpoint, uh, we don't have any concerns. As I mentioned, we reviewed uh, in-flight anomalies that we had logged so far uh, at the uh, PRCB Program Requirements Control Board, which is a program level board, on Thursday and went through the anomalies that we had uh, logged at that time, evaluated them to see if any of them would be a uh, constraint to the next flight. Now we'll do that again this coming week to look at the ones that we've picked up since that time. If there are none that are a constraint to the next flight, then we look at what else needs to be done. We're gonna have the, um, the uh, RSRMs, the motors all pulled apart, the joints all separated. We've got the igniters out, the nozzles are off. We'll look at all the field joints, make sure there's nothing unusual there that uh, we need to look at before committing the next set of motors to flight. Uh, back in Houston, MOD will make sure that they have uh, time for their people to, to uh, turn their control centers around for the next flight. Everybody gets enough rest. All the teams are ready to go to support. 
et cetera. And we'll go around to all the projects and make sure that each project is ready to support uh, flying on next Saturday. And as I said, uh, I think the last time we were together, if somebody's not ready, we'll wait until they are. But if, if everybody's comfortable with flying Saturday, when we talk about it on Thursday, then we'll press on and go fly. Sue Butler. Um, one related question. Have we definitely ruled out the 23rd since everybody's talking about launching next Saturday? Have you ruled that out? Because there was a consideration, right? To the 20. Also, uh, is this a way of things to come? Do you feel not only comfortable landing and launching the next one in, what, six days? And how does it affect uh, your workers, your hands-on workers and their sleep and their work cycles? What are your concerns or lack of concerns? In, in this case, from the standpoint of the team, we don't have a concern. Like say the orbiter processing facility, people have been uh, been anxious to get their hands on hardware again. The, the people that have been processing the, the vertical vehicles are, uh, are, are not totally independent from that, but but we have a, a team of engineers, shop, and quality people that are essentially either tail number oriented or they're facility oriented. So that team and the team that will, will process and launch the one next Saturday are, I mean, they've been ready, they're well rested. Uh, in fact, they're, they're anxious to get on with what was denied from them over a month ago when we had the shutdown. So. Uh, that, that's not a factor. The only time we, we get into considerations for launches and landings are, are some of the facility resources like communications and tracking and networks and those kind of things. We have to schedule such that we, we don't have a conflict with those kind of resources, but they're primarily equipment as opposed to people related. And, and we've scheduled that and we're comfortable with it. And I guess the other question is for Brewster um, on Endeavor. Can we talk about that briefly? Uh, the way I understand it, it's supposed to be a night launch and a night landing. Now, is that driven by when you catch up with Eureka? And would you consider moving the time up or down, depending on catching Eureka? Would you consider a day landing instead of a night landing? Uh, what are your considerations now? Um, <clears throat> yes, the driver for uh, 57, SCS 57, is to uh, rendezvous and, and, uh, and pick up the Eureka satellite. And when you uh, have a rendezvous mission, then you have, you're constrained when you can fly uh, based on being able to pull a rendezvous off. So the uh, launch window moves forward about 30 minutes a day uh, forward in time. And so uh, pick a, any day of the month and it establishes a time that you have to launch in. And it's, I guess we have about a 72-minute window, I think. Uh, and that moves forward each day. So uh, depending on what day you choose to fly, then that dictates when you have to fly. And yes, we are, we are looking at uh, how we want to uh, deal with, uh, with that. Uh, as you know, we like to avoid night operations unless we have a good reason uh, to do them. And so um, we are evaluating what we can do with uh, that particular mission. And if, uh, if we have the uh, ability to move the, the date around to get the kind of conditions we want, and that's being evaluated now. This also applies to your landing? Yes. Yes, it does. Bill? Uh, for Brewster, I guess, just to follow that up, I heard you guys had decided to go on June the 3rd, that would give you a morning, a daylight launch, and that, that I guess I'm wondering why it's such an issue to launch at night since you've done it eight times, because I'm looking ahead to Hubble. I know John Young wrote a memo about launching at night and building margins into the system. Is that a factor here? I mean, what's the thinking going on? Well, we are looking at uh, June the 3rd. We have not uh, announced that as a, uh, a launch date that's under consideration right now. Um, and if we did wait till June the 3rd, it would give us uh, a daylit launch, daylit end of mission landing, as, as Sue was asking about, uh, daylit RTLS, et cetera. The tail sites would still be in darkness, however. Um, 
but we are considering that for this flight because there is not a science requirement or a mission requirement that, that forces us to launch on a day that uh, it results in a night operation and uh, we're looking at how it would impact the rest of the flows throughout the year, et cetera. Uh, with respect to, uh, to Hubble that comes in uh, December, uh, that's still under evaluation and uh, we'll have to see where we get. We're a little more constrained on, on that one, of course, because of the time of year it is and, uh, and we'd have to wait uh, a long time, uh, several, several days, I think about three weeks as a matter of fact, in order to get uh, night ops. So that may not be nearly as attractive as, uh, as uh, the 57 issue. I mean, it was our understanding anyway that Eureka was experiencing some troubles and the Europeans wanted to get this guy back pretty quick. Is that, have you all worked something out on Eureka, that? Eureka has been uh, pretty stable uh, as of late. You know, they had, uh, they had some degradation of uh, their solar arrays early, early on. Uh, the last uh, couple, two or three months, it's been pretty stable. They haven't suffered any further degradations. So it seems like uh, that situation has, has um, settled out a bit. Uh, of course, we will, we will, as we think about these things, part of the process of thinking about them is talking to our customers and making sure that everybody agrees the course of action we're going to take is uh, acceptable. And uh, that's why you don't want to uh, say something prematurely. Susan Cole. Uh, Susan Cole for CBS Radio. So would you say that you have a, a challenging uh, schedule ahead of you since you are going to be launching um, you know, on Saturday and, and uh, you're really going to have to um, switch gears with you know, launch and landing? And is it going to be a challenging rest of the year? Um, I, don't, uh, I don't think so. Let me, let me go back and pick up part of Sue's question that wasn't answered before, and that is, do we plan to operate like this? No, we don't. Our goal would be to launch every six weeks. We could fly eight flights a year, then spread out nice and evenly, and everybody would, would uh, know how to plan their work schedule, and we wouldn't uh, spend a lot of overtime, and uh, it would be very convenient and comfortable to operate that way. But obviously, we're not always able to do that because of things like pad shutdowns, pad scrubs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the hardware and uh, and sometimes the mission requirements don't allow us to do that all the time. But that would be a very nice thing, a nice way to, to operate. But with the rest of this year, now we're going to, um, by the time we get the next three flights off, we'll be basically caught up and back on schedule where we thought we were going into the year. And so the rest of the year will flow pretty well for us. We had a question faxed in. Uh, did Sue, were you uh, wait, wait, wait for the mic, please. I just want to find out if we do launch the Endeavour on the third. Do you have a time, a launch time? Uh, it, it on the third of June. It would be in the late afternoon. I don't know exactly what time. We have six, a question faxed six, in by eight. Eight. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> We have a question faxed in by A.R. Hogan of Ad Astra. Uh, his question is, with this crew smaller than usual, what were the specific constraints keeping you from extending the mission by, or two, th by three extra days? And that's referring to 56. Uh, the constraining uh, factor on this flight was uh, cryogenics, uh, liquid oxygen and hydrogen we make electricity with. Uh, the payload requires a certain amount of uh, power and in supplying that power, we use up those consumables at a rate that did not allow us to fly uh, three plus extra days. Thank you. Uh, we're going to close this conference here with a little announcement. Uh, following this conference here, we're turning NASA Select over to the Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, Atlas II mission scientist Dr. Tim Miller will be available to answer questions specifically pertaining to the scientific aspects of the mission. And with that, we close this post-landing news conference. Thank you very much for coming.